Then, hi everyone. My name is Scott Brown. I'm the Director of Information and Family Support at the Arc of King County. Um, I am a uh, man with short hair, uh, some reddish facial hair and white skin. I'm sitting in my apartment uh, with some art on the wall behind me. Uh, I wanna just do a very brief land acknowledgement and briefly introduce a little bit of ground rules about our events this evening. I'm really happy to see so many people here and I know even more folks will be watching on recording later on. Uh, to, knock, to kick us off, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. Um, some access notes this evening. We do have cart captioning. If you look for the, uh, the CC closed captioning icon on the bottom of your screen, that's how you'll be able to access our captioning this evening. Uh, our event tonight is titled Stopping White Nationalism in the Disability Community. And we know that that is a topic that comes with a lot of different emotional investment. Um, it's going to be a really rich discussion this evening. And before we go into it, knowing that there's a lot of kind of emotional uh, pieces around this, to this topic, I want to make it clear that the Arca King County's role is to present all different types of information that will benefit our community. And we always try to do this from multiple perspectives and, excuse me, positionalities. Uh, we've seen tensions play out around this topic in particular. Uh, and we know that there's a pretty high chance for tension, conflict, uh, you know, disagreements, a whole bunch of different uh, feedback that I'm sure uh, we will get. But I want to make sure that knowing that there's that high chance for tension, uh, we want to lay down these ground rules to make it fair for everyone, keep our community safe, uh, and make sure that the information that's being shared with you all uh, is done in an efficient and uh, appropriate way. So first, the purpose of the event, this event is to bring people together with the goal of fostering understanding and respect. Uh, we have our own staff. Uh, at the ARC who are supporting this event this evening. We're monitoring the chat and the question and answer. Uh, we've turned the chat feature off kind of for everyone uh, for on purpose. There's a reason that we did that. Uh, and even still, I want to make sure that folks know that under no circumstance should we be using hurtful language or attacking our panelists verbally or, or in the chat feature in any way. Uh, and any participants tonight who are using any hurtful language will be removed at our discretion. Uh, secondly, under no circumstance should panelists or speakers be harassed before, during, or after the event. Uh, so, you know, we take we take the safety of our community very seriously. Uh, our speakers might not wish to share their contact information after this event, right? Uh, and for those who don't want to be contacted after the event, please respect that, right? This isn't an invitation to uh, start discussion with folks afterwards. Uh, and then finally, I hope that folks will be mindful while sharing their own information in the chat. Uh, and, you know, we work really hard to avoid the spread of misinformation and we continue, we continue to work really hard to do that uh, in our discussions. Uh, so just know that we're working to be very mindful of everything that we share as well. Um, over the past several years, we've seen the devastating impacts of white nationalist violence in our community. Uh, we've seen youth with developmental disabilities get involved in white nationalist groups. Uh, and there's been a lot of conversation about it and we hope that we can start, oh, sorry, there's not been a lot of conversation about this kind of intersection and we're hoping to kind of get that conversation rolling with this event tonight. Um, so you'll be hearing from some experts on this topic and we hope that everyone can bring this information and these conversations back to your own communities. Uh, and in doing so, our hope is that we do this uh, in a respectful way for our panelists and for our own staff. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to my colleague, Eric Warwick, who's going to give a brief explanation of white nationalism and then introduce our awesome panelists this evening. So thank you all very much. I'm looking forward to everything this evening. So thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Scott. So I'm going to share two slides um, that will help explain um, the issue a bit and um, having some trouble with uh, the share screen function. One second. Um, 
I'm gonna try this again. Um, sorry for the delay. <laughs> Here we go. So the first thing I wanna talk about um, is something we might be more familiar with is system of white supremacy. So white supremacy is a system it's based on laws like racial zoning. You can see a zoning map of Spokane here. There's also um, racist zoning that happened all across this country. Um, and it operates at both the individual level and the structural level. You don't need people walking around with tiki torches for white supremacy to exist and perpetuate itself. Um, and overt racial animus or hatred is not a necessary factor in perpetuating the system. However, there are the people who run around with tiki torches um, who are part of the white nationalist movement. Um, so this is a movement that seeks to create a white ethno state, a um, state for only white people. Um, it's based around anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and a fear of demographic change. So like the great replacement um, conspiracy theory, for example. Um, it's anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim and it has um, the goals of enacting um, policy that is anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, and it is formed on anti-Blackness, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, and anti-Semitism, and also ableism. Um, so um, I'm going to, with that grounding a little bit, I'm going to switch to introducing our panelists. Um, so um, I will let them introduce themselves. We have Shannon Martinez, um, Victor Gonzalez, um, Yante Dempsey, and Melanie Penner. So I'm going to have you introduce yourselves with your name, pronouns, and a short um, visual description if you would like, um, the order in which uh, you'll be speaking. So that's Shannon, um, and then Melanie, and then Yante, and then Victor. Eric, can you stop sharing your screen? Yes, thank you. Um, pause share. Or, sorry, I forgot how to do this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> At the bottom, there should be a button that says stop share or something like that. I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing only new share. Oh, um, oh stop share. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. No, no, you're good. You're good. All right, so I'm on. Yeah. I'm Shannon Foley Martinez. Um, I am, uh, it's my birthday, so I'm a 48 year old woman. <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing a red shirt. I have white earbuds in. I have uh, some glasses on. I've got like COVID, like old lady hair that's like multiple different colors. Well, as my kids would say, my silver mermaid hair is growing in. Um, and uh, I'm sitting in my uh, downstairs room. There's uh, some windows in the background, uh, and I uh, am she, her, and I'm coming to you from uh, Georgia. Hi, everyone. I'm Melanie Penner. I am um, a white, um, a white woman in my late 30s, not for much longer, um, and uh, I have brown frizzy hair <laughs> and glasses. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to introduce my credentials at this point. I'm a developmental pediatrician. I am also a scientist and I am doing some research in this area. Yante. Hi, uh, my name is Yante. My pronouns are they or she. Um, my video is not on, but there is a picture of me. I'm a white passing person with bright pink curly hair, and I research and track the conspiracy theory known as QAnon. And Victor. I think you're on mute. I am on mute, that's what I am. <laughs> I'm a Hispanic, my name is Victor Gonzalez. I am a Hispanic male, um, dark hair, tan skin, wearing glasses, red, white, and blue shirt. Um, in my porch and yeah. Um, as far as pronouns, he, his, him, and that's it. Are we supposed to give our 
background. I'm a teacher, so I mean, secondary teacher, so I see a lot of the stuff that's going on. I also teach ESL, so. Okay. Awesome, thank you. All right, so we're going to hear from Shannon now for about 10 minutes. Um, and then other panelists will have a chance to respond with other insights. Thank you all so much for like I'm on East Coast, so it's like eight o'clock. <laughs> thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day to come and join us. Um, I skipped over my credentials um, <laughs> during the intro. Um, I, uh, I work um, helping people leave um, white supremacist, you know, hateful, violent, uh, dehumanizing worldviews and networks. Um, and I work building prevention programs uh, hope to hopefully help uh, people uh, not end up in these spaces in the first place. My main audience for that is parents because I, in addition to what I do for work, um, I'm also a mom of seven kids. Um, and um, I uh, work with students from middle school all the way up through university grad students um, and uh, educators, communities, and, and um, I've also consulted for multiple foreign governments, um, government organizations, the UN, NATO, um, I've been on calls with the White House. Um, and how I ended up here was that when, uh, from the time I was 15 until the time I was 20, um, I was actually a, um, a neo-Nazi white supremacist skinhead. Um, and so the last, um, you know, 28 years of my life has been trying to understand for myself, like, how did I get there in the first place? Um, and then once my oldest son was born at, when I was 23 years old was like, how do I cultivate human beings who thrive, who will never look to hate or violence as a viable expression of anything happening, um, in their lives. Um, and because I was very open about my past and the, you know, the worst things that I had done and had happened to me very organically, people began to talk to me about their things or family members that they were concerned about or whatever. And so my foray into mentoring people, leaving these spaces happened very organically. It's something that I've been doing for like two and a half decades. Um, over time, uh, you know, obviously, um, as my own healing has continued to progress and like as, you know, I'm, uh, I've, now I'm up to about like 115 people that I've mentored leaving these spaces. Um, that a lot of uh, similarities have begun to emerge, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not a, a researcher by trade, um, you know, so my experience is anecdotal, like it's not, you know, I don't, I don't have the statistics uh, from a research perspective. Um, and a lot of, uh, so the overlapping of the similarities in our stories um, of like how we ended up in this stuff in the first place and like why there was this draw to us um, and, you know, the commonalities that, that were there um, have, you know, have begun to, uh, to emerge and utilizing that information is like how I look at like how do we actually build um, better prevention um, uh, infrastructure um, and how do we approach this so that we can help people to not find resonance with this with all this stuff in the first place. The biggest change um, over the time since I left and now is the you know is the is the internet. Like when I was in it, you know, I was I left by the 1993, right? So the internet, you know, was barely a thing outside of garages in California. Um, now, um, you know, so for me, I had a bunch of vulnerabilities. Um, I had multiple layers of like, of developmental trauma. I had acute trauma. Um, I had, you know, we moved when I was 11 years old. I was grappling with like my identity. I felt like I didn't really belong anywhere. Um, I had a very violent episode that happened to me. Um, and I happened to meet these like other, these white supremacist skinheads. And I think, you know, this like self-loathing in me and rage in me, like really resonated with the rage that they displayed. Um, and 
but that had to happen in a physical space, right? Like that I had to meet another human being or have a physical copy of a book or a record or something put into my hand that like introduced me to the conspiracy theories and to sort of like break down my barriers about like utilizing like racial epithets and, and things like that. And like to find a community, it had to be in a very, in a physical space. So I had to build like a physical echo chamber uh, around myself. When I talk to students uh, and young adults now, that it's like if I when I ask them like who is seeing anti-Semitic racist you know or racist comments or content online, a hundred percent of the hands go up. And so obviously these like accidents of timing and geography for people who find vulnerability with that have like risen exponentially. Um, that it is almost a certitude that our young people, if they have an, if they have internet access, will collide um, with um, these communities and networks. Um, and so for me, like that is incredibly alarming. One of the things for me too, as a mom, I have several um, neurodivergent children, um, and. Um, you know, understanding, you know, try, the, the learning that I have had to do in order to try to be a good, you know, mom to them and stuff too, that I see so much um, overlap with a lot of the vulnerabilities that, that exist for people to ever find resonance with, with um, these networks and communities in the first place. Um, that one of the draws, I think, particularly for like neurodivergent people is that um, in, in our country, the very sad reality is that a lot of neurodivergent people have a lot of layers of trauma under, you know, the best intentions, some, sometimes, sometimes not, intentions of the systems that we live in, that they, that, that, and I think that there's research to back this up, maybe Melanie knows, um, that, um, that neurodivergent people, um, ha, you know, have very high levels of experiencing trauma, that there's something called um, adverse childhood experiences, um, that sort of measure these sort of la layers of, like, of traumas that are there while, like, while we're young. Um, and th there have been addendums to that um, that expand out to things, but I don't think there's one yet that really includes the experience of um, neurodivergent people growing up in a very neurotypical system or whatever. Um, that part of the draw um, of this too is that, um, that it's very like black and white thinking. It's, it lacks complexity in part, that it offers people a very easy to hold on to explanation for why the world feels like a dangerous and threatening place, right? That it's like, that it becomes very easy to hold on to this idea of like, oh, there are easily identifiable groups of others who are to blame for my, why my experience of the world feels like it's dangerous and that I am under threat all of the time. I think also, um, uh, and I like a, a large percentage of the people that I have mentored um, ha have a lot. No one story has ever started. So everything was awesome in my life. And then um, I ended up like doing doing this stuff. A large percentage of them um, have um, have some sort of uh, neurodiversity as part of their life. Um, all of them have multiple layers of trauma. Um, a significant number at this point, it's about 7%. And again, this is an anecdotal, um, have uh, come out as either um, non-binary or as trans since they like left white nationalists and, you know, other like adjacent um, parts of this like milieu or whatever. Um, so that those are sort of like the threads and the commonalities that um, that I see again uh, and again with the people uh, with whom I'm working. Um, and I think that there is a growing body of research too. And I like I am very sensitive to how we talk about this. Right? I was I did an interview for CNN, and they had inter after the um, Buffalo mass shooting, and they they shared this. Um, clip of another student talking about how they felt really like something was off with this shooter while they were in school. And the, the interviewer is asking her like, oh, well, or that I'm not sure, I don't wanna misgender them. I'm um, asking them like, oh, well, what was it? was it just sort of like this looming threat? And she was like, yeah. And like, he didn't make eye contact. And I'm like sitting waiting for them to ask me questions. And I was like, 
look, your kid not may, and it's okay for any human to not make eye contact for any reason. Any, like, that is super okay. Like, that is not a warning sign that your child is going to, like, go and commit a mass shooting. Like, we, like, we need to be very clear on that. Like, I was, like, literally panicking as I'm, like, you know, sitting on CNN. Like, that is not a warning sign, right? So that it's, like, this sensitivity of talking about, okay, like, there is one in, you know, in my experience that there is some correlation, at least, between the number of people who are neurodivergent who end up finding resonance in these spaces. And some that has a lot to do with like so so many levels of complexity of that trauma, of you know, social anxieties that are around that. So it's easier to have social co connections that um, are online communities, right? You don't have to like filter through all of the all of the, you know, the stuff <laughs> that all of us neurotypical people do that confuses the hell out of everyone, like our weird inconsistencies and all of the stuff that we do that make things really complicated to communicate, um, things like that, that, you know, so like, I think that there are some reasons why that, um, why that there is this sort of like correlation between that. Um, but there's also this complexity that is like, you know, like autistic, folks and neurodivergent folks are not like more likely to commit acts of violence than like any, you know, than the neurotypical people or anything like that. So I'm very sensitive to the complexity of that while at the same time, like struggling to, um, to grapple with like, how do we talk about this and how do we talk to our kids and particularly, you know, like how do we approach this with um, like our neurodivergent children to like, just to not just be like, okay, you're in danger of being a terrorist or whatever. Like, I think we're like all white kids are in danger of becoming white, you know, white terrorists, um, which, um, you know, obviously my view on that is somewhat skewed by what I do every day, but I'm just like, just like I teach my kids, you know, like, Hey, you're potentially somebody that's going to get hit by a car. So I have to teach you how to cross the road safely. You're potentially someone who is going to be the target of you know some kind of like sexual violence or whatever particularly on the internet so i have to teach you about how to be safe around that or you are potentially someone who is going to become you know addicted to drugs or alcohol like i have to you know my job as a mom is like okay well let's have these conversations around this even if it's something that makes me feel uncomfortable or i don't even really know what words to say at this point or whatever um to talk to you about those things and those dangers that are there so that I can better prepare you to keep you safe. Um, and for me, so much of this is, um, is oriented around the idea that like everything is marketing and all marketing targets our emotions, right? And so learning to better identify your own emotions and learning how to identify manipulative content um, and like, and how that is like, if, if you're looking at content and you're like, wow, yeah, like I feel really hopeless and this is the only place in space that like, I feel like that that sense of hopelessness is something that I can talk about, um, that that's gonna be like a really big allure, but learning how to identify like, what is the content that you're seeing online? What is that tapping into in you? And what are they trying to gain um, what, is it influence? Is it, you know, what, like, what, what is their purpose behind that? That's sort of gaming the system that they're using to draw people in, using things like struggles with identity, struggles with belonging, feeling alienated, feeling alone, feeling like there's information that's been withheld or manipulated their whole lives, feeling like, um, you know, the, the future is really hopeless and that, you know, like that there is no place for them in the greater world. Um, talking about those things like with our kids and helping them to see how what they're viewing online is tapping into those things, especially because those are so like, they're, they're so, such like parts of our like essential need set of like being truly seen and heard and feeling loved and able to give love and feeling this, this empowered connections is something um, greater than ourselves. And so that like, that's just like sort of like an intro of the work that I do and just a brief overview um, for brevity's sake <laughs> for my 10 minutes. <laughs> so I will, stop, I will stop there. Yes, thank you so much, Shannon. So does any other panelists have something they wanna to add to this or? All 
Okay, um, Shannon, thank you for that. And, and um, it resonated so much and also resonated with so many of the, the trepidations that I had in, in pursuing this line of, of research. Um, and I think there, are, this is a, this is a, a, an area that we need to discuss with, um, you know, extreme sensitivity. And I hope it's my hope that that by kind of using research methods and and working very closely with autistic people, um, <coughs> can um, help to bring some meaningful information um, to this space. So I, I this I called my little talk down the rabbit hole autism and online extremist content and there's a picture here of Alice in Wonderland and she's looking down the rabbit hole um, and some of this is how I came down this rabbit hole of uh, pursuing this topic okay so my disclosures I have research funding from different places um, that doesn't pay my personal salary it allows me to hire people to do work that includes sources from the Canadian government and from Autism Speaks. I've done some consulting work um, with one pharmaceutical company and a province in Canada. I've already introduced myself as a white, cisgender, heterosexual, neurotypical woman, which um, you know means I am studying um, a group to which I am not necessarily a member. And I'm coming to you from the traditional territory um, of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Anishinaabek, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit in Toronto. So one thing I wanted to start out with is, is and, and Shannon touched on this too, Shannon touched on a lot of these things already, but um, you know, the internet has often been a really positive space for autistic folks. Um, there's a great opportunity for social interaction and community. Um, there's, there's a correlation between social media use and happiness um, in autistic adults. It falls off after a certain point, um, which I think probably happens in neurotypical adults too. Um, and there's a lot in here about autism and identity formation too. So a lot of autistic folks come to you know, find out more about themselves and more about what being autistic means um, through um, their time online. There's a quote here um, um, that uh, I have put up from someone on Twitter when I asked about this. Um, the internet was where I first found out about autism in women um, through the autistic community. It's been my best resource to learn about autism, but also how to navigate a diagnostic system that's based on a very masculine version of autism. And I will say from my own personal experience, um, the internet, social media has helped me as a researcher, as someone who kind of came up in a very medical model um, to learn so much more um, about autism directly from autistic folks. And so I think there are lots of reasons to remember that the internet can be a positive space. However, the cheeky torches have already been mentioned once, but this is, um, this is a, a very, now iconic picture from the Charlottesville um, rallies um, in 2017. You can see, um, or the picture has um, lots of um, kind of younger white men um, and some are kind of screaming, one particularly screaming quite angrily. And this is this was the inception of my interest in this because I was listening to a, a podcast after um, after this event, and I heard El Reeve, one of the one of the journalists who was um, who was embedded actually with the um, white nationalists at, at Charlottesville, and reported out that many of these um, these men were using terms um, like weaponized autism on um, online spaces like 4chan. And I heard that, and as, as a physician who does autism um, work uh, uh, as a researcher in this space, um, I was absolutely horrified to hear that term, weaponized autism. And that to me was just something I wasn't going to let go of. So um, I started pulling together a team um, to try to understand that and, and learn a bit more about what that meant and what was going on. 
So we're doing, this is part of a bigger study that we're doing, and these results are not published yet, so they're not peer reviewed as of yet. These are preliminary results that I'm going to show you. Um, so we went on, well, we didn't have to go on Gab, thankfully, but we still did have to read the content. So Gab is, um, is a version of Twitter that is um, very much uh, into, um, they would say free speech, which um, if you know anything about these spaces often um, tends to become quickly just filled with um, lots of xenophobic uh, white nationalist content. Um, so we went, we, we have a, a scraped group of, of posts from Gab and we analyzed them for mentions of weaponized autism. And here's what we found. So the vast, the, the majority of the time, as far as we could tell from analyzing the posts, um, there, this term was used by non-autistic participants. Um, however, there were quite a few people who were talking about autistic people and, and in this weaponized way um, in GAB. Um, what, were, what did they mean when they, meant, when they said autism? Well, they meant a really stereotyped version of autism that was based on classic tropes. Um, so Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory is, would be one example of this. Um, and I put in a quote from um, my wonderful postdoc who did this work. Um, uh, they were described as all powerful masters of technology who are also socially inept. Um, and these, the, these group of sort of stereotyped autistic features um, were perceived as being things that could be exploited to further the far right's objectives. Um, and the kind of the, the, the description of, of autistic people as being a one, on one hand, you know, extraordinarily powerful in terms of their technological abilities, but um, having social challenges, actually they would not phrase it quite so, so nicely, um, meant that they could be easily convinced um, or exploited into doing, um, doing the bidding um, of other people on these sites. Um, in the like far smaller set of um, autistic folks who who were who were among this group who were posting, um, they discussed feeling excluded in real life um, and finding a relative sense of purpose um, with this group. So I, I think like this idea of vulnerability is the main one that that comes to me. Um, and and Shannon, you know, has has so much more experience in this and and has covered this, but I think, um, and I've put up a picture here of, um, one of the pictures here is of Christian Picciolini, who is a collaborator on my project. And he has this model of, you know, what people are looking for in these movements. Um, he's broken it down into identity, community, and purpose. Um, and I think anyone can be at risk for that. I don't think there's anything specific to being neurodivergent there. Um, I also think here, and I've put another picture up of the rabbit hole podcast um, from the New York Times that the way one of the, the additional risks that we face is the, the social media exposures and the algorithms can actually quickly set you up with a lot more kind of progressively more extreme content. Um, risks in autism. Still, you know, same thing, identity, community, and purpose. And I think here, um, there are ways that, and as Shannon described so beautifully, like autistic people um, can struggle in their identity formation because of stigma that they face. Um, they can struggle to find a community. Um, and they can, uh, we know that rates of kind of education, completion, employment are quite low. And finding that sense of purpose can also be an additional vulnerability. Um, I think there is something to kind of be said here about um, sometimes a sense of, of rigidity for some autistic folks um, who really like things in a, in a black and white way. And some of the ideas and solutions that are presented in these spaces um, are quite concrete, as we would say, over probably like overly concrete and, and overly simplistic in terms of the world, world their worldview. 
Um, and so I think that adds an additional kind of layer of potential vulnerability. And then intense interests, I think if this becomes your intense interest, it's easy to go further and further down into it. So what are they at risk for? And I think, you know, we've already heard about the mass shooting kind of risk, and that is the thing that that that's the thing that comes to our mind. But I want to highlight that there are a lot more risks. Um, so there are various forms of exploitation that can that can occur um, and various levels of vulnerability um, that people might have to, to, depending on their developmental needs. Not all are being exploited, though, and some are very much there, you know, by 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 choice and fully, you know, in control um, of their their actions and decisions. Um, you know, you can be, you could be um, participating in a public event associated with xenophobia, and that has um, associated, you know, risks to your future reputation and things like that. There's personal violence and risk of suicide is such a huge, huge thing here. Um, and I, I don't think we should, um, we should gloss over that one. And then there's the interpersonal violence, uh, harm to family members, intimate partner violence, and then some of the online things. And then the societal violence is what we tend to think about, um, uh, but I don't want us to forget the rest. So thinking about detecting risk, so like, Making sure you're you're checking in with um, with kids, friends, um, family members about online life. Um, can I play too? Is a big thing that we that I say in my family. Um, and how much autonomy you give someone online will really depend on kind of their developmental level. And you know, you, should you do you need support in interacting in a chat room? You know, with other people. Is that something that you can handle safely on your own, for instance? I put some sites um, down that are some of the riskier, well, some of the ones I would be that would raise some flags for me if people were on 4chan, Gab, Parler, some Reddit subthreads, incel sites, but this is a moving target. Um, and then I will say watch for signs of anxiety and depression, particularly um, suicidal ideation, because there is support out there. Um, I'm going to actually skip this because I I think, you know, the main message for kind of what to do is um, often in the realm of mental health um, supports um, and trying to advocate for for that person to get them because they might not be easily um, available. What I do want to talk about more is kind of thinking about prevention. And to me, this is all about supporting positive identity formation, allowing kids to do to spend time doing what they love. Um, and often for our neurodivergent kids, that means not just therapy. <laughs> um, beyond, I've, I've put some pictures here of um, hobbies that are present in my family. So I knit and my husband cross stitches and my kid does fan fiction. Um, and so all of us have developed our own identity around those things. Um, be on the lookout for bullying and nip it in the bud quickly. Um, and then help kids build positive emotional support strategies. So support their needs, give them a supportive environment and empower them um, to, to learn how to kind of manage um, those big feelings that can come up. Um, and so I don't think, I don't know if anyone has suggested knitting as a, as a strategy um, to stop white nationalism before, but there you go. <laughs> that is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. Um, we're a bit short on time, so Yante, it, you're, you're good. It was mostly our problem. Yante, do you want to um, talk about your work? Oh, sure. Um, so hi, my name is Yante. Uh, like I said before, I research and track the conspiracy theory known as QAnon. So I'm going to talk about QAnon, some specific ways QAnon appeals to autistic people, how white nationalism is incorporated into QAnon, and finally, some suggestions for what to do if your loved one is involved in a conspiracy theory like QAnon. So QAnon is a big tent political conspiracy theory and cult. QAnon centers on cryptic posts made by an anonymous person or group, simply known as Q, who claims to have high level security clearance in the government. These posts were primarily made on a website called 8chan, which is now known as 8kun, which is known for harboring extremist content, including the manifestos of multiple mass shooters. 
the main activity of QAnon believers is deeply analyzing Q's cryptic posts in order to form theories and decipher their prophetic meanings. The overarching QAnon belief is that there's a global cabal of cannibalistic elites who sexually abuse and traffic children, and that Donald Trump is leading true patriotic Americans in the charge against this cabal. I say it's a big tent conspiracy because it encompasses a vast array of other conspiracies, many of which rely on anti-Semitic tropes. Though there have been in-person QAnon events, gatherings of believers primarily occur online. The online nature of QAnon, combined with believers' use of public social media networks, makes it relatively easy to infiltrate. So I made accounts using a fake name and an AI-generated picture on multiple platforms to follow and interact with QAnon adherents. I made quote-unquote friends and participated in discussion groups about Q's posts. I even recorded an episode of a podcast with a QAnon believer as my fake identity. Um, so having been involved in the QAnon community for a few years, I've gained some insights I would like to share with you. So why do people get involved in QAnon in the first place? The main motivator among people I've observed and interacted with is a desire for a sense of agency. Many QAnon believers express a sense of powerlessness about the world around them, about political corruption and the ills of society, um, and things in their personal lives as well. QAnon lets believers feel like they're part of a massive operation that seeks to dismantle a great evil. Many believers have said their entry point into QAnon was their calls to, quote, save the children from pedophiles and child traffickers. So people get involved out of a desire to help, to be one of the good guys, to feel like they're actively positively contributing rather than passively accepting the evils in society. Once you're in, the social culture of QAnon uh, gives it incredible staying power, especially for people who were already feeling isolated. The ability to rapidly build a community on social media is baked into the social culture of QAnon. So one thing you'll frequently see QAnon adherents doing on social media is participating in what are called follow trains. These are posts with lists of usernames, and then you're encouraged to follow everyone on the list and share it. It's highly encouraged to follow back anyone in the community who follows you so you can both expand your social circles. And by relying on these social circles for information, QAnon adherents believe they can circumvent mainstream media or as they call it, fake news. The end result is that instead of a curated social media experience, you're instead quickly exposed to a wide variety of extremist content being shared by your fellow patriots. Because more people are seeing your posts, you're also much more likely to get engagement on your posts and have interactions with your fellow patriots and QAnon believers, which makes it easier to form relationships with other believers. Another common part of the social culture of QAnon adherents is a recent loss of family or friends who have cut off contact with them due to their increasingly extreme beliefs. Many believers express that they've repeatedly tried to show their loved ones the light, but eventually gave up or were shunned. And the advice from other QAnon believers is never to try and reconnect with these people, but rather the reassurance that your fellow believers will be your new friends and family. And believers find genuine solace in their new found family, which powerfully reinforces their echo chamber. Hmm. Um, as an autistic person myself, I think it's important to take a look at some of the unique ways that being autistic can intersect with belief in QAnon. So first, I wanna dispel the erroneous notion that autistic people are immune to propaganda and therefore incapable of falling into cults or conspiracy theories. There is no type of person immune to conspiratorial thinking. It's not a moral or intellectual failing. It's simply a reflection of some normal psychological need that was previously unmet that participation in these groups fulfills. Uh, now, I want to talk about the word autist. Q 
QAnon believers use the word autist to describe people in the community with the ability to hyper-focus and find information who are obsessive and highly perceptive. Uh, they'll also use the phrase weaponized autism to refer to the focused application of these traits. Melanie mentioned this term earlier. So I talked earlier about the highly cryptic nature of Q's posts. The autists are the people who obsessively find connections, bring in obscure knowledge, and build theories explaining these posts. Among QAnon believers, autist is a compliment, and the autists are frequently referenced in Q's posts alongside patriots as people deserving of praise. Attempting to decipher Q's cryptic posts and going down the rabbit hole of related conspiracy theories can easily become a special interest for an autistic person. I want to define a term here. So giving exhaustive information about a current special interest in a single go is a common autistic practice known as info dumping. Um, it brings a lot of us great joy to be able to info dump about our special interests. But uh, oftentimes info dumping is not received well. The person on the other side might consider it oversharing or a social faux pas. But among QAnon believers, however, info dumping about QAnon related topics is yet another positive trait attributed to autists. Autists who demonstrate great knowledge of Q's posts and related conspiracy theories and those who produce extensive theories about the posts are rewarded with social clout in these circles. For people who have otherwise experienced rejection for exhibiting these autistic traits or for being labeled as autistic, participating in QAnon social circles in this way can be immensely validating. <laughs> so I explained before how the social culture of QAnon makes it easy for individuals to be exposed to increasingly extremist views. Many self-identified patriots express and amplify transphobic, homophobic, racist beliefs that easily coexist alongside QAnon's anti-Semitism. White nationalists who don't adhere to the core Q beliefs still find these spaces to be fertile grounds for recruitment. One reason for this is that white nationalist ideology has its own set of conspiracy theories. For example, the Great Replacement, Eric mentioned that earlier. Um, the Great Replacement theory is a conspiracy theory that says that Jewish elites are plotting to use immigration to replace a white majority. So QAnon already relies on recycled anti-Semitic tropes and conspiracies, and as a big tent conspiracy, it invites links to other conspiracies. That makes it easy for white nationalists to introduce their racist conspiracy theories to people who already believe in QAnon. They can also appeal to QAnon believers' sense of patriotism, packaging their white nationalist beliefs as patriotic yearning for America as it once was, or put simply to make America great again. So with all that said, what can we do? We know that cults and extremist groups target isolated people by appealing to a sense of camaraderie and support and then act to further isolate people to keep them dependent on the group. So that's why preventing your loved ones from being isolated is crucial both as a form of protection against recruitment and as a lifeline for those who are already involved. When asked what helped get them out, many ex-QAnon members cited close personal relationships and having frequent interactions with people outside of QAnon. So it's absolutely imperative to keep a line of communication open. When talking to your loved one, the most important rule is not to argue with them about their beliefs. These beliefs are not grounded in facts or reality, and fact-checking them won't work. There's also been some research indicating that trying to debunk conspiracies in this way can actually lead to the backfire effect that will actually cause the person to feel more resolved in their beliefs. Cults and conspiracy theories thrive on adversarial conflicts and an us-versus-them mentality, and arguing will firmly establish you as an adversarial them. So if you can't argue, how do you engage? The first step is to listen. If they're trying to talk to you about their beliefs, that's actually a good thing. It means they still care about you. 
think of it this way. If you found out there was lead in your water, you'd want to tell the people you care about to stop drinking it. It's the same with QAnon adherents. They strongly believe that they have information that can save the world from a great evil, and they want to make you aware. The trouble is that in most cases, these warnings are met with attempts to debunk, despite their conviction that they know the answer. To them, it's like they're showing you a water quality test that says the water is full of lead, only to be repeatedly told, well, I always drink the water and I'm fine, you're delusional. Dismissing them will only push them further into the group of people who will listen and validate their beliefs. So the first step is to listen. While debating is off the table, discussing is not. You can try asking them questions that show you're interested in hearing what they have to say while also planting seeds of cognitive dissonance. Don't approach the discussion like a lawyer conducting a cross-examination, but rather as a curious person who is sympathetic and open-minded, but doubtful. Some questions you could ask are, why do you believe that? Where did you find that information? How do you know the author is credible? What other things do they talk about? If all this evil is real, wouldn't your time be better spent improving yourself or helping the community? Is it possible there's another explanation? How does focusing on this help you? Couldn't some of these people be motivated by money to say these things? How many of these predictions come true? What if they're lying? And so on. Your goal is not to convince them, but rather to show that you hear them and to introduce some questions that they won't hear from other believers. You can also, of course, engage with them about other topics. Ask them about how their other hobbies are going. Bring up something interesting related to one of their special interests. Uh, if you don't know what their special interests are, now is a great time to find out. Uh, remember earlier how I mentioned info dumping is often met with negativity. So you can invite them to tell you as much as they want about what they're interested in and engage with them about it, ask questions about it. It's important to remind them about their other passions and to give them space to share that with you without the fear of dismissal or rejection. Finally, I wanna to try to get them out of their echo chamber. Invite them to activities. Try directing them towards new communities and hobbies. You could try finding a weekend class or workshop on some interesting topic, going to a, a fair or festival of some type, or visiting a museum or exhibit related to one of their interests. Even just going for a walk, watching a movie, or playing a single player video game is time they're spending away from their online echo chamber. The bottom line is you need to talk to your kids. You need to learn what they're interested in and support them in cultivating those interests that are grounded in a reality outside of the conspiracy. You need to listen to them and not be dismissive or combative. And you need to build a relationship where they feel like they can talk to you and actually be heard. Thanks. Thank you so much, Yante. Um, next is Victor Gonzalez, and we're just gonna go over a little bit. So, all right. Um. Hello, um, my name is Victor Gonzalez. I'll try and keep it brief, just for time's sake. I'm I'm not gonna run through a bunch of different scenarios. Um, the biggest thing we have here, and I think every everyone else that's on the panel has come back to this fact. I'm a teacher, so I've actually seen where those kids are being targeted or being drawn in through things as far as things I've seen them, heard them say, and also things that they've said to other students. Um, quick review just so I can just let everybody know as far as there's 7.3 million student uh, students in the American educational system that receive special ed. I mean, I didn't break it down to how many are autistic, how many, but I looked at this as though we were just doing special ed, special needs and mental illnesses all, all together. But we're looking at about 14.4% of all the educational population. Um, let's also recall, as everybody else has said, um, and I think we all know that white nationalism is also part of 
the base part of that is nationalism, which in and of itself is a problem as nationalism starts to lead to the idea that one country is better than another, but then whenever we bring in white nationalism, one group of people who live in this country are better than one uh, any other country. That is perpetuated and leads to more of a fascist idea. And fascists generally tend to, in his, historically, look for sim to find simple answers to the problems that their their people are facing or that their nation is facing. Hitler found the idea that inferior races were causing all the damage to Germany. Here we have the idea of replacement being thrown out by that conspiracy theory being thrown out by media and or QAnon, everything else. Um, so when we start looking at those things and we start thinking about those who all, do feel other, uh, like they're other, which would be our people who are marginalized because of any deficits that they may have, be it autism, be it any other mental disability they might have, they're easier to manipulate into that idea. Um, and as far as what my experience, as far as whenever you start talking to these students about things, because I have, um, and ask them why they think that way, they can't really tell you why they think what they, they understand what they think. Um, so it, I believe that the biggest thing we can do is actually have those conversations with students or actually have that conversation in a classroom setting where we can not not so much single people out, but just to get that those things across, I think people need to be looking for those indicators in all students and whether they be um, autistic or not. I mean, all those things are happening in our schools and they do breed hate and the hate does lead to violence in some instances. And I believe all these things are being brought up as this is generalized and I'm not using any of my statistics or anything, but be because of people not willing to stand up and talk about the issues. Um, with that, I'll stop. Um, again, I believe the biggest, the, the greatest thing to combat this problem that we are facing that as far as of white nationalism is education. We need to do a better job of educating our students and educating our children. That's it. Thanks. Told you I'd keep it brief. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciated that. Um, so um, yeah, thank you so much for um, joining us. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for a question and answer. Um, but if you do have questions, please, please feel free to send them in and um, you know, I hope this is not the end of the conversation. I hope this is the beginning of a conversation for all of you in all of your communities um, to, um, you know, find ways to talk about this issue and then combat this issue because it's really important. Thank you. Thank you. So I just want to jump in and thank the panelists so much. That was just incredible. You all of you were really good speakers and shared your um, experiences really in a, such a compelling way. And as a parent and just a person in the world, I really appreciated everything you shared. Um, and for everyone who's in attendance, if you could take a minute to complete our survey, we would be so grateful for your feedback and putting it in the chat. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much to everyone who's here. And have a good night, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for uh, inviting us. Stay dry. It is yes. wet out there tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank <clears throat>